Uh, I'm Carlos. Um, you know, I'm I'm doing my PhD at ETH, and I we wrote this paper with with Andreas, Nathaniel, and Roger on uh, yeah on improving one shot grab generation. So hopefully you like we like our improvements. Um, yeah, and then I guess we can uh, start. So you know, just as a reminder for everyone, right? Like. Uh, what makes the graph generation special, right? So, so as you all know, right, graphs are these discrete structures uh, that we usually represent as matrices, but they're not really matrices, right? Because we can permute them and, and technically have the same graph. But if we do this permutation, then you know it's very non-trivial even to tell that these two like graphs are actually the same graph. And you know, furthermore, like the number of nodes in the graphs can vary, which um, means that you know we cannot just like generate them as matrices, right? We need to do something smarter. Um, so of course there are many traditional generation approaches, but you know we're uh, machine learning people, so you know let's look at how you know machine learning approaches work. So yeah, as you Hannes asked about these uh, regressive models, so like the two main approaches are either these are regressive or one shot approaches, right? And uh, in auto regressive uh, models, we kind of cheat a bit in in the sense that we impose some. Uh, Kind of arbitrary ordering on the nodes, and then we generate the graph one node at a time, right? So we kind of take a new node and try to add it back into the graph by checking which edges kind of make sense. Um, yeah, and they're very easy to train, right? Uh, of course, uh, the generation is slow because the process is so too aggressive. And uh, well, what's a bit more of a problem is that uh, they're a bit more prone to mem data memorization because we usually train them with maximum likelihood of you know edges added at every step. Um, and also, they're not necessarily that great at capturing global structure. Like, for example, uh, if you train them to generate grids and ask them to generate uh, a different grid that was not seen during training, it will likely just do something that's like, you know, a grid plus, you know, some unfinished columns, right? Which is no longer a rectangular graph, but it's locally kind of like a grid. Uh, in contrast to this, you know, we, uh, oh, we have to watch. Sure. Why, why do you say uh, tend to memorize training data or why? To, uh, yeah, why are these autoregressive graph generation methods more prone to memorizing training data than one-shot approaches? Well, so one thing is we, we did actually observe them memorize uh, the training data. Um, another thing is that, you know, uh, why is that, uh, again, you kind of usually do maximum likelihood training, right? Like as in you order the nodes in some, sand, in some order and then just try to kind of, you know, do the same as the training set did, right? At every, every step essentially, which yeah. can lead to, to some memorization. Of course, it doesn't necessarily do that. Um, yeah. OK, I don't. Maybe, uh -huh. maybe also to say that, to add to what Carly was saying, is that they're very, very powerful. RNNs are usually uh, like amazing at uh, expressing different things. Um, and here there's also this thing that you, you depend on the on the ordering of the graph so there, all these factors seem to play come together to you know encourage a bit the memorization but it doesn't yeah. mean that always they will memorize right it's just yeah. it, empirically we tend to observe it yeah, it yeah sometimes happens all yeah. right and and the sordering is kind of, you know, potentially kind of shoots you in, in the foot, right? Because like with one given ordering, it might be kind of hard to generate a different graph in some sense. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess we can, uh, yeah, move to do to, to one shot approaches, right? So in, in one shot setup, um, you know, it's it's kind of more of a free form where we just, you know, sample some noise and have some neural network architecture and we just want it to give us the graph, right? And then the neural uh, network architecture can be, you know, permutation variant and all the other nice things. Uh, and and these uh, models, you know, have done well historically have mainly been used for generating small graphs and especially molecules, right? Like graph V, Molgan. There's also a very nice recent uh, paper on denoising from from University of Amsterdam and EPFL, and and also iClear of this year on uh, generating molecules in 3D space using denoising. Um, so yeah, so they work, you know very nice for, for these small molecular graphs, right? And, and you kind of don't depend on ordering, well, depending on how you actually construct the neural network and the training procedure, right? And what's nicer is that, you know, because, well, they're not sequential, they're parallelized, they're fast, right? Uh, 
but they don't necessarily do very well uh, on larger graphs. Um, yeah, and like since we're cons considering Grant, Gantz in, in particular in this in this paper, you know, let's look at some kind of existing uh, GAN baselines, right? So uh, one of the very first ones uh, was MOGAN. Um, that's well, first, you know, let's say that you know, essentially every time you do a GAN with graphs, you do a GNN discriminator, which is a very natural choice, right? But then for the uh, generator, you need to think of something smart, right? So MOGAN uh, essentially did the, the simplest thing you can do, right? You just sample a random vector, you feed it into an MLP, and then you ask the MLP to produce uh, a full adjacency matrix. So you then symmetrize, discretize, and hit a graph. Right? Uh, now, of course, this is not very nice because you know this doesn't account for permutation equivariance. Uh, it, it also, like, it's not straightforward to uh, deal with different number of nodes. Like, of course, you can truncate the adjacency matrix, but that's a bit awkward, right? Um, so yeah, so and this, sure. Like the, the discretization of the predicted log logits of the MOP, if you want mm -hmm. to call that, and, um, wait, how, how do we even generate a different number of, um, of nodes? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we can just do n max, right? Like as in the yeah, MLP ah. gives us like n max, and then we just randomly drop something. Plus, we can supply n as input, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's not great, right? Getting <laughs> uglier and uglier. And yes, yes. Yeah, and then you you also like you discretize, right? And you symmetrize, mm -hmm. and can can you differentiate through all of that or do you need some tricks? Yeah, so sure you can you can essentially just differentiate right so um you know the semesterization well you can truly ask them of to predict like the upper triangular right and just copy it over to, to the lower triangle right, for first symmetrization and for discretization you can either do gumbo softmax or you can do um just uh straight through estimate right so, yeah. So, oh, okay um yeah so it's uh, certainly not great, right? But that's why people like, for example, uh, Gigi Gan, which was Andreas's um, previous work on, on generation, um, you know, he first looked at, you know, okay, can we do the, the more sane approach in, in a way, right? And then just sample some random vectors and then treat them as a set, you know, or process them as a set using like, say, attention, right? Or some other set architecture. Um, to then you know, move the points around in the space such that uh, we can just apply a kernel function to recover the edges, right? So if the points are close, you know, they get an edge. Um, so it turns out this, this naive approach doesn't really train very well uh, because you know, for, for the set network, it's potentially very hard to map, well, to ensure that the uh, set, that kind of the graph size or, or that the nodes are distinguishable when you kind of transform them into this graph embedding. Because, you know, sometimes some points can be sampled very close together, sometimes they're very far away together, and you somehow still always want to, you know, transform them in some equidistant uh, representation. And you kind of need to ensure that, you know, different points from here go into different thing here. So it's uh, like a hard assignment problem to solve. So what he proposed to do there is um, to uh, just learn a fixed uh, support, right? So just a fixed set of points, again, cap to n max. Uh, and then, you know, during sampling, you just add some random noise to each of these points, right? And then transform them into some graph, right? So essentially you have some learn template, right? And then you add some noise and then adjust the template to get a graph. Um, so this like worked quite well, right? But again, only for, for small graphs, right? And it didn't even really train for graphs which, you know, like 50 or more nodes, which like is like bigger graphs, but they're not huge. Um, you know, and then so the natural question is, is why, right? So one thing or one problem with one shot generation is that, you know, you need to adjust all the points at the same time, right? So you kind of need to make some global structure work and, and some local structure work, which is moving like a bunch of points at the same time. And if you move one point, you might need to move all other points, right? So it's kind of a, um, a problem, right? Which autoregressive uh, methods um, work around by just adding one node at a time, right? Because then you can already have your best effort graph built and then just need to kind of greedily add one node best you can, essentially, uh, right? But for, for autoregressive, oh, I'm sorry, for, for one-shot models, that's not that easy, right? And for example, if we consider the tree graph, right? If, Task is just generate trees. 
which regressive models do, of course, very well in these, right? But for a, um, for a one-shot model, you know, if we want to kind of check if this edge should be added or should not be added, right? Like the, the this model kind of needs, or like each of these nodes, essentially you need to gather information from all the other nodes in the graph to kind of note that there's definitely no cycle, which will need very many layers and very many steps, which again kind of makes this problematic to train. Um, so, you know, our idea here uh, was that, uh, you know, maybe we can just kind of deal with the big level structure separately, right? And like ensuring that somehow it's are cycles or there's a number of uh, clusters in the graph uh, and then just fill in the given template, right? So for this, we can we can look at, at spectral graph theory, right? And here we visualize the, um, the embeddings of the uh, normalized Laplacian eigenvectors or for like first two normalized Laplacian eigenvectors for you know, some given graphs. And as you can see, right, they, they correspond to uh, like some sort of a clustering or usually provide some smooth um, kind of distribution of points, right? Um, so yeah, so the idea is, you know, maybe you can just make a graph generator and condition it on these first few eigenvectors, right? And generate, you know, new graphs that are, and, you know, now the generator only needs to account for local interactions, right? Because the global interactions are kind of given by, by the spectral event. Um, so a bit of a spoiler alert, right? This actually works. Like for example, here we depict, uh, you know, a true graph from the <clears throat> from from the death set, right? And it's spectral embedding. And then if uh, given our uh, for a model that I'll show you a bit later, uh, you know, you feed in this spectral embedding, uh, it can produce you a, a graph that's you know almost the same, you know, but well, a tiny bit different, just like a couple of edges to different. And here, you know, we also plot the graph using the spectral embedding of the nodes. Um, so you can actually see that, you know, most nodes in, in this graph retain their, their positions or their conditional positions. Um, and also we extend the architecture with, with eigenvector generation, which, uh, yeah, and then, you know, we can generate fake eigenvectors that are somehow similar, right? And, and build a graph out of them, which again is kind of similar. Of course, with eigenvector generation, the, the thing is that you know we like these eigenvectors actually come from a graph, right? So we can we know that you know we can build a graph from these, right? And even if these somehow look statistically similar, right, we cannot necessarily guarantee that there is a graph that can be built from them. So there's a bit of more of a projection error that we expect essentially building a graph. Hannes, you have a question? Yeah, does it make any sense if I say that you're graph then only is good at capturing uh, spectral properties of of the distribution of our graphs mm -hmm. or does the only there make no sense at all because the spectral property or the spectrum of a graph captures the like all everything that we could want to capture about the graph if we're not only talking about the eigenvalues but also mm -hmm. the like if you're talking about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors together. Uh, yes, so kind of, you know, what, what we do here is essentially we only consider the first few eigenvectors, right? So of course you have all of them, you can create the graph, right? That's clear. Um, you know, for, um, for some kind of, uh, you know, when using very few eigenvectors, as also as you see here, right? Like, you know, when you kind of enforce usage of literally the same eigenvectors in some graph classes, you know, this results in not super different graphs, right? Given the same eigenvector set uh, or first couple of uh, eigenvectors. But that uh, is also because, you know, the, um, the generator learns to be restricted to a given graph classes. And, you know, the, the, the discriminator uh, includes, you know, a GNN, right? That does the general GNN thing essentially, right? And checks that kind of, you know, the degree distributions and, and whatever are kind of similar. Um, and so we uh, we will see a bit later, I guess, uh, that uh, you know for for or well, I, in general, I did observe that you know for some graph classes like you know these planar graphs, if you could, you, know, you will get very similar examples if you feed in true eigenvectors. Um, it, but uh, for some other graph classes like SBMs and so, stuff, which are much more random in some sense, right? Um, you will get actually like with one set of alien writers, you can get you know many different samples because there's kind of the global structure is a bit uh, is a bit clearer and the local structure is somehow less uh, less restrained. 
and even for Maybe. protein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, no, finish. I just wanted to add something to what you yeah. said. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to say that, for example, even for protein graphs, we saw that, you know, you can feed in true eigenvectors and, and get, uh, you know, protein graphs that are not the same, right? Like, does it have a substantial number of different edges from, from the, if you um, give the same eigenvectors, right? Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, sure, Andreas, you wanted yeah. to. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, from to answer what Hannes was asking from a different perspective is any joint distribution of you know random variables you can factorize it and say p of x comma y is you can write it as p of x given y times p of y right so so here y could be the eigenvectors and x given y could be the graph given the eigenvectors so even if the eigenvectors are a partial view of the data you can still express any distribution this is also what you're doing with the regressive models, right? You're factorizing a distribution over variables one at a time. One given, you know, one, then the second given the first one and so on. Yeah. So in terms of expressivity, you're not losing anything. It's just about what, what is easier to model, which conditional or mar marginal distribution is easier to express. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um... Yeah, then, uh, then I guess we can uh, we can now move on to like how the the actual uh, GAN works, right? So essentially, um, in in our GAN we have uh, three different GANs uh, stacked sequentially, right? So first we well okay, so first for every GAN we you know process the noise with some MLP and some normalization like we do to GANs you know like style GAN and whatnot. Uh, but then we have three different uh, generators and three different discriminators, right? Uh, so, for example, if we consider the, uh, the adjacency generator, it's a probably powerful graph network that um, takes first k eigenvector embeddings and first k eigenvalues. Uh, and then from those, it tries to generate a graph, right? And the eigenvectors and eigenvalues are supplied to both the generator and the discriminator, right? And because we usually want to use few eigenvectors, you know, the task isn't necessarily trivial to reconstruct the graph. Right. So um, will, you, will you also? Um, like this is just a high level overview and you will also get into how you, um, for example, how you sample your sets and then mm -hmm. how you transform them to end up with, uh, with eigenvectors or something that could be eigenvectors. Uh, sure, so I can talk also uh, a bit more here about this, right? So uh, the, the sets are always sampled from a normal distribution, right? But the idea you resample one vector if you just want to generate eigenvalues, right? It's, it's kind of one, one sequence. Uh, or if you want to generate eigenvectors or, or, or a graph, we always uh, sample an M size set, right? Uh, well, like all of this is conditional number of nodes, number of nodes be, you know, pick some other way as a sample from the training distribution. Um, Right, and then so we have the set, right, and the MLP uh, for processes the uh, the noise IID, right. So it's just really applied on each element of the set. No fancy set models or or, or whatnot. Uh, one thing that actually interestingly seemed to help a lot was uh, to normalize the noise to unit length before inputting it to an MLP. This again comes from image uh, GANs, but uh, it's sort of like it gave us surprising improvement in how quickly the, uh, especially the, the adjacency generator converged, uh, which was a bit unexpected. Um, but yeah, so uh, coming back to this, right, for, for the adjacency generation, we then, if we take the first uh, few eigenvectors, right, we can just multiply them with ourselves to kind of get a rough template of the adjacency, right? Like it, of course, looks nothing like an adjacency, but there's some similarities, right? Yeah. And so we can feed this into, uh, you know, a probably powerful graph network, a PPGN, um, you know, as, as an adjacency, right? But PPGN, uh, uh, as its own, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the architecture, but it essentially works directly on matrix representations, right? And it can, well, it can technically take just tensors, right? Because the, the normal PPGN convolution is that you kind of have an N by N by H matrix, right? That you produce Y1 MLP, you then have Again, an end by end by H matrix is produced by another MLP and it's just a matrix multiplication between them. And that's, is that, you know, yeah. A quick summary of how we process those matrices possible. Like you uh, for L0, right? And then how do you go from your L0 to your final L? 
Yes, so um, so essentially we apply a bunch of these uh, PPGN layers, right? Well, so one thing yeah. is that as node features, we first supply, supply you know, the eigenvectors, and eigenvalues, as node features to every node in the graph, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we essentially just apply a bunch of uh, PPGN layers, right? Which again, PPGN is outputs, you know, uh, end by end by something matrix, right? But that's what I mean. What is this, uh, is it possible to quickly explain how a PPGN layer works? That it takes uh, a last as input and outputs okay. something of which we know that it is another plausible Laplace. Uh Well, so it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's a Laplace, right? Like so, yeah. In the, in the paper, we kind of just uh, you know internally it's just an embedding, matrix, right? It's also uh, internally a high-dimensional uh, embedding. So yeah. In the paper, we kind of just gave it as a vague intuition that it kind of, you know, continuously refines population. But uh, here it's just, you know, just an embedding matrix, right? We don't actually apply any constraints. Um, so essentially, we feed in like a partial ablation matrix in, in the inputs, and at the end, we expect to get an adjacency matrix or kind of to the discriminator, we feed it in assuming that it's an adjacency matrix. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's yeah. a question in the chat about um, whether you constrain the generated eigenvectors to be orthogonal or yeah, no. yeah, yeah. like I'll, I'll cover the eigenvector generation, I guess, uh, in the next slides. But yeah. but yes, yes, like we generate the eigenvectors uh, so that they are uh, eigenvectors <laughs> essentially, or that you know, like the first yeah. eigenvectors are on a sheaf of manifolds, so you know, they're. Um, and, and just to confirm, like, uh, mm -hmm. are you using right now the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the adjacency or of the Laplace? Uh, we use well, so technically this could work with anything, but we always use uh, normalized Laplace. Normalized Laplace. Okay. Yeah. And did you try other kinds of uh, matrices and see if there's any difference, or you just? Shows that one and stuff. Well, that. in some sense, we just chose that one. Like we briefly tried uh, non-normalized Laplacian. Um, it did also work, like maybe a tiny bit worse. But the main reason to go for a normalized one was uh, that it gave uh, more nicely behaved eigenvalues because you know tend to from zero to two. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, otherwise they can kind of be anything. Um, so yeah, yeah. because. You know, for a normalized Laplacian, we kind of essentially got off easy in the sense that, you know, to generate the eigenvalues, we uh, could just apply, uh, you know, one DCNN, right? It just generates a short sequence, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but then when you generate the adjacency matrix uh, or the Laplacian matrix from the eigenvectors, uh, mm -hmm. you get like non integer units when doing that. Like, yeah. You get so fractions. Yes, so yeah. like the, the template we fit into the uh, uh, adjacency generators, yes, is something that's, you know, less than one in magnitude. And usually, yeah. like, because we use few eigenvectors, it's something very small, like 0.015 or whatever. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll let you go into the more into more details before asking more questions. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Yes, so coming back to this, so the adjacency generator is, is essentially just, you know, kind of takes these node features, just this template of, of a Laplacian that's not really anywhere close to an adjacency, and then we essentially just ask it to output an adjacency matrix at the end. Um, yeah, and then the discriminator is kind of a symmetric architecture, which is again a PPGN that takes an adjacency plus all the spectral node features as input and, you know, produces an estimation of is this a good graph or not. Um, now, of course, you know, we, we want to generate fake graphs like from nothing, not just conditional true eigenvectors, right? So we, uh, we have two more generators, as, we met, as I mentioned. There's a simple eigenvalue generation, which just is a CNN, you know, produces some non-decreasing sequence of values. Um, yeah, and then we have the eigenvector generation, which is a, a bit more involved, right? So as you saw in the previous slides, uh, like eigenvectors essentially correspond to like clustering of, of nodes, right? So as a discriminator, we just use a point net, which is a simple, you know, uh, universal uh, architecture made for point cloud classification. So that's kind of all nice and good, but as like yeah, someone asked and then, um, in the chat, uh, the eigenvectors themselves have, you know, a lot of restrictions on what they should be, 
So, so to, for the eigenvector generation, um, we kind of need to do something different, right? Uh, so one simple thing uh, to first note is that if we consider a matrix of eigenvectors of like first k eigenvectors, right? So k less than m, um, this matrix then belongs to a Schieffel manifold, which uh, means it's a subset of a full uh, SON matrix or like a full rotation matrix. Um, and you know sure. we can, yeah. If you're going to use this Stiefel manifold term more like this is just the top k eigenvectors. Yeah, yeah, it's just top k eigenvectors, right? Like, uh, yeah, like in theory, you know, to be precise, it, it kind of means that you need to reside in this manifold, but yeah, it's just top k eigenvectors, right? Uh, but then the kind of the simple concept is that, you know, to go from any k eigenvectors or any, you know, or this or orthogonal. Uh, vector set to any other such set, uh, you can do it by multiplying it from the left by an n by n rotation matrix, uh, or multiplying it from the right by a k by k rotation matrix. Well, this part technically doesn't allow you to go to any other point, but it uh, still ensures that you stay on this manifold of, of k eigenvectors. Um, yeah, and you know, so, so the idea behind the eigenvector generation is that we can kind of First, take some eigenvectors, right? Or like some orthogonal set of vector of k vectors, right? And then we can kind of iteratively uh, refine them by constructing these rotation matrices. Um, so, you know, the, the architecture we propose for this um, is, uh, yeah, is, is, is kind of as follows, right? So, first, we use the eigenvalues. Well, first, we have like a bank of, of learned Stiefel manifolds. So, we have like 10. Uh, sets of parameters, right? Each of which produce like 10 uh, eigenvector sets or kind of as in like rotation matrices from which we take first k eigenvectors. Um, and, you know, so using them, yeah. These, um, how do you, how do you come up with these skew symmetric matrices, I suppose? Yes, um, so like, uh, so, you know, we essentially just, Take the just a discrete symmetric matrix that has this upper diagonal number of, of parameters, right? Well, a bit fewer for 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 first k columns. Uh, so we essentially just you know uh, treat them as learnable parameters, right? So we have a set of ten of these kind of discrete symmetric matrices, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, that we can update through gradient descent, um, and then we you know just use an MLP and Gumbel softmax uh, like you know in VQ GAN. VQ, uh, BAEs and stuff, right? To just select one of these banks uh, or one of these samples from the bank to be useful, right? Like, um, like having this larger bank of like 10 eigenvectors or so, it had helped, but it wasn't necessarily crucial. So you can just assume that we have one learned like fixed yeah. rotation matrix in the very beginning, right? Because like with that, you still got like 90% of, of the performance. Um, so you have this one like learned rotation matrix for which you take the first three columns, right? And then you pass it to a, another point net, right? So it's this is just a set model, right? It takes this input n times, yeah. Um, so what do the eigenvalues do here with our, they just involved in the choice of? Yes. The, okay. Good. Yeah, yeah, so you somehow try to guess which is the closest set of eigenvectors, given eigenvalues. Um, yeah. Okay. So coming back to this, right? Um, so you know, then now you want to construct these refinement matrices, right? Like uh, rotation matrices from the left and from the right. Um, so how how we can do this, right? Is we just take um, a, a set model, right? In this case, a point at ST, but you know, just, just a general set model that takes you know some some set with ten points. In this case, you know, it's it's the um, the node dimension in the eigenvectors, right? Uh, that we process, we get another n times h matrix, right? Then we do an inner product of this n times n to, to, time, to another n times, uh, sorry, n times h times uh, transpose of the same matrix, right? To get uh, like a n times n matrix, which we can turn into a skew symmetric matrix, like this, and do a projection. Uh, and then from the skew symmetric matrix, we can pull a rotation matrix by just doing a matrix exponential, right? And then we have our left rotation. Um, you know, similar, you know, and then we multiply the eigenvectors by this left rotation, and then we use this partially refined eigenvectors to construct another uh, matrix uh, 
kind of to see that we can rotate from the right. Here, the construction is almost the same. We again have a point net model that you know processes the set, but then we are because you know it's not an n-dimensional output that we want in this, but you know a kind of a k by k rotation matrix. We use some pooling and uh, MLP to just spit out the the parameters for a skew symmetric matrix that will result in a k by k rotation matrix, and then we take this k by k skew symmetric matrix exponentiate get a rotation matrix. So uh, to... this is fair to summarize as we have our um, bank of Stiefel yeah. uh, where we have a skew symmetric a skew symmetric matrix. Yes. And then we have a um, then we generate a rotation matrix which we <clears throat> like an arbitrary rotation matrix which we apply to our a skew symmetric matrix and then we end up with a yeah. skew symmetric matrix again uh yes well so not with the skew symmetric matrix right so if like uh well so technically Hagen vectors right are uh are rotation matrices in general right or well at least for um for symmetric uh adjacencies like the Laplacian Hagen vectors will be rotation matrices um otherwise they can be unitary matrices uh, they're not the real value. Um, but yeah, so, so we kind of, uh, we can use a skew symmetric matrix by matrix exponentiation to get a rotation matrix, right? And like any uh, vector right. set is, is a rotation matrix, right? Of course, we only care about first K, right? So we just essentially drop the rest of the matrix, right? We take the first K uh, and then we kind of, well, now just some arbitrary Hagen vectors, right? And we kind of somehow want to make them better, right? Um, and how we can, to transform one such matrix into another, you know, matrix that again has the same features as in, you know, it's, it's kind of unit length, orthogonal, you know, whatever. We can do this by multiplying with rotation, right? So we kind of want to arbitrary, yeah, come up with arbitrary rotation matrices to multiply our set of Hagen vectors with. Yeah, so we, we always just generate rotation matrices mm -hmm. and apply those to uh, something that could already be eigenvectors. And because of that, we stay in the realm of eigenvectors. Yeah. And but we can change them as we want arbitrarily, and we have every possibility to change them as yes. we want with this approach. And in the end, we end up with some hopefully yes. nice. Yes. Eigen yes. Yes. All right. So you have okay. <clears throat> can you explain more about the bank? Like, what is the effect mm -hmm. of bank size and the uh, um, if you directly generate this kind of step your matrix will be work or not? Like it seems like bank is a restricted space and what mm -hmm. is the effect of the bank size? Uh, well, so as I said, you know, like we, we saw that even if you use a bank size of one, this still works decently, right? Like so the yeah. bank size helps a bit, uh, but not terribly much. Like we even observed that, you know, at, uh, during some times of the training, it depends on, on essentially the graph distribution. Uh, because like for, for some, we, well, we tested this on some other graphs, like for example, grids, um, you know, so for grids, we observed that it always used at least a few elements of the bank, because I guess sometimes, somehow, you know, wide grids are different from, from square grids or something, right? Uh, but for some, um, for some other uh, graph distributions, like even SVMs, I think it, it didn't necessarily matter that much how many samples in the bank you have. But uh, essentially, because the model is allowed to, uh, you know, select them freely, it can just choose to not use some of them, right? Or uh, it can just converge to different samples in the bank being essentially the same. Right? And uh, we, so we, don't, we don't have a restricted space, right? Because the yeah. if we just, after the first rotation matrix, we already uh, could get anything. Yes. With every possible eigenvectors. Yes, yes, technically, yes. Yeah, but I want to know if you set the bank size too large, is there any badness or like if there's no hurt? Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really, well, okay, so we didn't try anything absurdly large, like, you know, a hundred or a thousand. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, we, we didn't see any benefits in decreasing it if, if we put this All the great. other way. Nice, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Johannes, you have a question. Hey, uh, thanks for your talk so far. I'm, um, I'm maybe a little confused. So as far as I know, the Stiefel manifold mm -hmm. contains matrices. 
the columns of which are orthogonal. And we yes. can move along the Stiefel manifold by uh, right multiplying orthogonal matrices. Yes. And so I, I have two questions somehow in the context of this. Does it uh, matter whether you learn rotation or orthogonal matrices? And mm -hmm. uh, maybe the second question is how do you interpret the left multiplication by R? Like, did you try leaving this out? Might it be sufficient to only write multiply? I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, well, so as far as I know, actually the left multiplication is the thing that allows you to go anywhere. The right multiplication still keeps you on the Stiefel manifold, but I'm not sure it actually allows you to go anywhere because it kind of, it's a bit limited on the amount of things it acts upon, right? Because it only acts on the K things at a time. Um, but uh, yeah, going back to, to this, like actually, Yes, we did try to leave out the L and like we tried leaving out either of them, right? And it actually, well, keeping both was worked the best, right? But actually the keeping just the right multiplication was a tiny bit better than just keeping just the left multiplication. But that's likely because of how we, of how we construct the left multiplication because this inner product of, you know, X, X transpose is a bit, eh, uh, in some sense, I think you could mess with the gradient for a bit. Um, yeah, and going back to uh, the rotation matrices and orthogonal matrices, right? Like, so rotation matrices are just orthonormal matrices, right? So they're just matrices which have like all the columns that are orthogonal plus their unit length, right? So they're essentially the same thing. Okay. But, but then with your output U, you're aiming to stay on the Stiefel manifold, right? Yes, yes. Okay. That's oh, interesting. So it seems that in practice, learning right and left multiplication works better, even though I guess in theory, only one of them should be necessary, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And like left is certainly necessary, but the right one, I wasn't entirely sure. Like I said, you still stay on the Stiefel manifold, but I'm not sure you can, can you point on it. Can to me, like why the, the left is certainly necessary and the right is not as important? Um, well, so it, it kind of, uh, I guess if you would think about just, you know, like the Schiefer manifold comes from a rotation matrix, right? Like just an N by N matrix. So some columns from an N by N matrix, right? Um, you could, you know, go from one rotation matrix to another rotation matrix is just, you know, you multiply two rotation matrices, right? And you get some other rotation matrix. Um, so essentially the action that applies is, you know, as large, right? Because in some sense you could, I assume Stiefel manifolds just be, well, okay, this is not strictly true because that wouldn't be orthogonal, but you know, kind of as a n by n matrix the times another n by n matrix, which just has max columns, right? Um, yeah, okay. I'm I'm good. It's it's it's, it's complicated. Um, uh, the first, for, I think also the Stiefel manifold has, you can also distinguish between matrices with determinant one and minus one, and they're like to disconnect the components on the manifold, but you know, it suffices to stay in one of the components. That's one thing. The other thing, like I don't have like exact numbers in my head, but uh, I think you can use the degree of freedom, number of degrees of freedom argument to talk about like yeah. how many, to, to, like, of the degree of freedom yes. you would want to express any point, any U. Um, and I think you can do that by saying, okay, the first, it's just basically a unit vector in, in N dimensions. The second one, you need a vector that's orthogonal to that. So, and then you keep going. And I think what will come out is that the number of degrees of freedom that you need yeah, is more like than the right. K. Yeah, yeah it's the so degrees it, it of freedom. It depends somehow on N. Whereas on the yes. K by K, it doesn't depend. And one, one last thing is also perhaps one of the reasons why it was this, uh, this is a hypothesis, right? it's not tested or something, but uh, there's this interesting property. So here, uh, the um, eigenvector matrix, it over rows, it has to be permutation. We want it to be uh, permutation equivalent. So basically they're uh, a set with N vectors in K dimensions. 
and perhaps it's, it's a little bit more difficult to learn uh, rotation matrix under this with this additional property. But as on the other on the other side, the right multiplication, it's it's you can always order the eigenvalues in a I mean uh, assuming no eigenvalue multiplicity, uh, you can always order them in, in a unique way. So maybe learning them is also easier. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, John. Sorry. Oh, hi, <clears throat> hi guys. Uh, thank, thanks for the cool talk. Um, yeah, I just had a question. Well, kind of two questions. But um, the first question: these right and left uh, matrices. Do these correspond to the factorization of the graph Laplacian? You know, basically using a similarity transformation. Um, are those <clears throat> are those matrices? Do they actually represent um, that factorization that? Um, that you would you would get if so effectively you would have um, if, if you took the Laplacian matrix you would have um, uh, you know a rotation matrix multiplied by a diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues multiplied by um, another um, orthogonal matrix are, are the, and so I'm, I guess my question is, is that what those right and left matrices mean? Are they part of that factor, matrix factorization or are they something else? Yes, I guess you can, could actually look at it this way, right? Especially again, the, the, the left matrix, if you consider it, if you want to generate all n eigenvectors, right? Then you can just kind of well, represent this eigenvector matrix as one rotation matrix, right? As, as a stack of many rotation matrices. And that's essentially right because be, because if that if, if that's the case it, it would potentially explain why one matters more than the other because the the right um uh orthogonal matrix represents um you're projecting into the eigenspace um uh, you know where, where everything's diagonal right so you're basically um you know th th those are the eigenvalues you're you're projecting back you know onto to diagonalize mm -hmm. your matrix and then um and then the uh, the left uh, the left matrix represents projecting back into real space. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm just not sure whether those in fact correspond to that matrix factorization or or not, or if they're or if they're different. And that was that was the question, but it would potentially yeah um, yeah. So then, how the right multiplication would exactly be written into this factorization? I'm not hundred percent sure. But the left multiplication, yeah, you could just put it in there. Um, of course, with this right multiplication, it's harder because it's k by k, right? So then you could yeah. only consider the partial yeah. multiplication. And, and, and then the other question I had, just I think on the follow-up to the previous question. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it sounds like what you're doing to learn um, <clears throat> to learn these uh, eigenvectors is you're kind of sort of learning like the Lie, the Lie algebra of SON. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you're basically enforcing this uh, anti-symmetric generators of the group. But I was wondering, could you actually directly just learn the group? You know, because what, what is there is there a reason why you have to learn the generators and then exponentiate them to get the actually the actual group, um, the Lie group, um, or or could you directly enforce? So so the group, mm -hmm. the, the actual Lie group will just have be orthogonal, right? Yeah. The generators will be anti-symmetric. So I was wondering um, yeah. why you chose this approach. Or... So you could, I guess, technically just include like a loss term, right? Like, because then you have your your point nets, right? To just uh, or MLPs that give you some some matrix, right? And you could just assume it to be a, a an SON matrix, right? For SOK matrix in this case, and just have a loss term that enforces it to be exactly a rotation matrix, right? So that that you could certainly do. Um, but uh, well, you know, there's I guess two things here. Well, like especially with this projection, I'm not sure how well that would work. Like with just MLP producing the rotation matrix, sure, why not? Um, but yeah, but the, the thing is that uh, you know, just doing it in, in the light space didn't necessarily cost as much, right? Because the matrix exponentiation is, is still somewhat fast in practice for these you know medium sized matrices. Um, and you know, for MLPs and stuff, it's it's natural for them to uh, to produce the values in the tangent space, essentially, right, and not on the manifold. Um, but yeah, but uh, you could certainly uh, 
do this with, with just a, a loss term, right? But okay. this way we we ensure that you know it's, it's definitely only mandatory because if you do it as a loss term, you know it could be okay. And then one last question I'll just ask is maybe could leave it to the end, but I'm, I'm just curious with this spectral approach, have, have you found that um, the, the GANs generate, are able to generate like local structure as well as global structure, or is there any trade-offs that you've seen using a spectral approach where maybe you lose sort of local um, resolution compared to, you know, having a more global, um, resolution yeah. yeah well so i guess the answer is is, is 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 twofold right so one thing is that the sagan vector generation you know it, it's 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 quite hard right and it doesn't necessarily work that well for high case so we cannot generate like a full Laplacian or full adjacency matrix like this right this and it doesn't work like that. um but now you know if we generate the first k we just leave the local structure uh to the gnn right which then you know gnn said good at local things, right? So you can just fill it in. So as the overall architecture, it does, it does well on, on the local structure, but that's mainly because we have a GNN after. Um, Got it. Okay, yeah. cool. Interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, I guess uh, no more uh, comments. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, so another thing is that, you know, we, we do this like left and right multiplication a few times, but in our case, we Three times, like I said, you know, again, giving it a bit more times kind of gives you a bit nicer eigenvector matrices. So um, you have yeah. three of those, uh, three of those layers, or you uh, yeah three times the same. Uh, so they don't uh, share weights. So it's it's like okay. this orange thing. So essentially, you know, build the left multiplication to multiply, build the right multiplication, yeah. multiply, happens uh, three times with three different you know, sets of parameters. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, the Sagan vector generation is kind of the, the, the main, uh, there's actually like, if you're interested in how to work with this Sagan vectors, uh, like Derek Lim, I think has a paper on, well, a bit of a different problem, right? But their take process, um, they kind of give Sagan vectors as, as input for, for node features on the normal GNN task, right? And they, Develop a universal eigenvector processing network to, um, to kind of get better uh, learned node embeddings, right? To use in normal GNN. Um, so, yeah, so they, they also have a bit more theory on like, uh, universality. And in some sense, their architecture is a bit, uh, has some similarities to, to our generator. Um, but yeah, but so, so, you know, this was a bit of a, like a high level view of the architectures and, you know, three generators, right? Like just the GNN for, for, for traditional like grab generation or adjacency generation, just a one DCNN for generation of, of eigenvalues and this, this uh, kind of involved uh, generator for eigenvectors, right? That, that I'm still this, and this manifold. Did yeah. you ever see eigenvector generation in another context? In your... No, no, no. We we looked for it, but didn't find <laughs> anything. Yeah, it seems like something that might have multiple applications somewhere else. But yeah, if anyone needs it now, you have a way to generate eigenvectors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. to give historical context, that's, that was our original motivation. You know, okay, the eigenvectors are interested. Let's see if we can generate them. Uh, okay. But then we became ambitious. When when we did that, it was like, okay, so what? <laughs> so okay, perhaps we can use them for graphs. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, but <clears throat> so you know, like, well, this was a uh, high level of the architecture. But there's still like a bunch of like essentially engineering tricks that help to make it work, right? One quite big one was that the architecture is essentially symmetric, right? Like the, the adjacency generator and the discriminator are just PPGNs that are you know essentially the same. For eigenvalues, it's again just one DCNN, so it's again essentially the same. For the eigenvectors, it's slightly different, right? Because we do this and force uh, them to stay on, on, on SON. Uh, but uh, but still, you know, it uses point nets and, and both parts, which is somewhat similar, right? So this symmetric architecture seemed to make it much easier to train, right? Also, like uh, what I didn't really uh, touch before, but um, 
Here, you know, we kind of uh, apply Dijon forcing because, you know, normally to generate fully fake graphs, you pass fake eigenvalues to, that you generate, right, to, to generate fake eigenvectors, and then you pass the fake eigenvectors and fake eigenvalues to your adjacency generator of the BGN, right? They use your full um, new adjacency matrix, right? But during training, we actually uh, do teacher forcing, right? As that in the beginning, you know, you feed then true eigenvectors to, to the adjacency generator. And actually, like even throughout the training, you always make sure to feed in at least some true eigenvectors and eigenvalues to adjacency generator. And the same for, for the eigenvector genera uh, generator, you always try to feed in some true uh, eigenvalues so that it uh, doesn't collapse, right? And kind of doesn't somehow diverge into some weird, weird place. Um, yeah, and also, you know, we need to play around with, with gradient penalty because you use the VGAN formulation. Uh, and, you know, it's not necessarily clear how you, for example, interpolate two graphs, right? Or two sets of eigenvectors. Um, because, you know, normally when you apply a VGAN uh, loss in, in, uh, in images or something, you just interpolate the fake and the true image and call it a day, right? For graphs, you cannot really do this. So for graphs, we did um, a bit of. Uh, Someone have a question or does this this kind of demo means like it's not easy to make it work really good? Uh, yeah, so it kind of means that you know there's there's uh, a lot of some some you know kind of engineering effort that uh, was needed, right? Like constructing the gradient penalty and, and, and such. Like and well, you know, the overall architecture isn't necessarily the simplest thing in the world, right? Because you have these three generators and you need to kind of stitch them together. Um, so that being said, but uh, actually like the conditional uh, part, like as in generating adjacency matrix with, with the PPGN, conditioning on some eigenvectors uh, worked surprisingly well and like surprisingly robustly. Um, yeah, so here, but you know, to do the full GAN thing, it needs a bit tricks uh, for some engineering effort, but that's just in generally true for GANs, right? Like for images, they also do a bunch of uh, things. And well, of course, these are mostly very, um, borrowed from, from the rich uh, How do you deal with the eigenvector uh, ambiguity issue? Like, for example, multiplier one, then um, you have a negative and positive mm -hmm. for all the eigenvectors. And if you have multipliers like larger than one, you have a rotation part. Mm -hmm. have you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so uh, we uh, essentially always. Um, sort the eigenvectors as a set, right? So essentially apply as, well, you know, so trivially you can just, uh, for each eigenvector, you can check the, if the absolute value is positive or negative, right? And we multiply it by minus one if it's negative to ensure that it's always positive, right? So we kind of um, ensure, Restrict. yeah. Um, restricted that. Yeah, in, initially I'm thinking like the bank size have some relationship with that. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, you said like increase the bank size size won't hurt the performance. So I'm not sure whether it is related to that part or not. No. no but but yeah, so so you know the eigenvectors you kind of yeah of course of force directionality essentially. Cool. Both the true and the fake so you know the, the discriminators always also see the consistent view. Um, yeah, and then, you know, coming back to this one, also kind of important thing was that for poorly powerful graph neural network, we added some, some improvements. Like, um, again, you know, if you know how, how it works, that it does kind of the, the one convolution is just multiplying these two copies of n by n by hidden dimension matrix uh, with another copy of, of a same size matrix. Um, you know, we added uh, normalization by square root of n, like what uh, transformers use in self-attention to ensure that the gradient um, magnitude doesn't grow, right? Or gradient variance, sorry, doesn't grow with many layers, right? We also added to instance normalization to seem to work much better than any other kind of normalization. And also in, in BGAN, you cannot really, or you should not use the batch form in the generator. So to, to reverse, yeah, some um, like architectural considerations needed to make this work as, as well as it did. Um, yeah, and you know, now we can, I guess, uh, get into some numbers, fine. Um, so here we have uh, planar graphs, which uh, just are delineate triangulation graphs of you know, random sets of points, um, and stochastic so Bach model graphs, uh, oh, sorry, planar graphs have like fixed number of 64 nodes. 
uh, the SBM graphs or on the nodes that has some functional graphs, so we have a few uh, like clusters of nodes that are sparsely connected between the clusters. Um, and in this data set, we chose to have between two and, and five clusters. Uh, and where do the, the, where did the planar graphs come from, or how do you generate them? Uh, so we we do like the linear triangulation. Oh, sorry, um, the linear triangulation of random sets of points. Okay. Essentially. Is that some some usual thing that's that's oh, so that that is an easy way to uh, to come up with a flatter graph <laughs> um, yeah. as well. Of course, the linear triangulation is used in, in in places, but here we mostly did it so um, there's kind of easy to check if if the graph is really good, as in, in this case it's planar, right? Um, and then it's uh, like a somewhat hard graph to model. Right, because yeah. it has a very particular structure. Um, yeah, so uh, so the planar graphs are just sixty-four nodes, you know, just random planet like the relation graphs and uh, stochastic block model uh, kind of has between two and five components at random and uh, between twenty and forty nodes, if I remember correctly, at each component also at random. Right, so you kind of have a high variety of graphs that are in the data set. Um, and here, you know, like as people traditionally do, we do uh, MMB measures, right, of, of like degrees, like of various graphs, this is like, you know, degree, histograms, clustering coefficients, orbit counts, uh, eigenvalues, or, uh, or response to, uh, or eigen vector response to uh, bank, uh, uh, set bank of filters, this is the, the favorite MMB, right? Uh, so this is, uh, you know, more or less the usual setup, but what we do to, uh, for, for, but, you know, these are just some essentially some random numbers, right? It's very hard to interpret, right? Or what is good or what is bad. So for, uh, to, to get around this, we could, we actually compute the same MMD ratios between the training set and the test set. So we essentially have some baseline of graph similarity, right? That we can expect because, you know, naturally it, it will be weird if you do much better than training set, right? Uh, in comparison to the test set. Um, so we compare the, so we compute these MMD uh, values, you know, versus the well training set versus the test set. Uh, and then we provide a, a mean ratio, right? So it's a, you know, for each MMD, we divide it by the training set MMD and take the mean over all the different MMDs. So this essentially represents like statistical similarity. Uh, this ratio represents statistical similarity in graphs. And we ideally want it to be one, right? To be as good as the training set compared to the test set in this various graph statistics. Uh, and well, you know, in some cases we get close to that. Um, now, oh, wait, I actually accidentally included one extra line. Oh, this wasn't finished. That's a whoopsie on me, but, uh, or that. um, yeah. And, um, yes. And, uh, so is it, sure. You had a question. Oh yeah. Thank you. Also, uh, you already like can suffer from this kind of mode collapse, right? I'm not sure in your case, do you notice this kind of a stuff or not? Uh, yes, yeah, so not really, but uh, why we didn't was that uh, teacher forcing, right? Because like without it, it could certainly collapse, right? But because we always kind of throughout the training feed in at least some true eigenvectors and some true eigenvalues, it, it's kind of forced to, uh, you know, at least generalize to those, right? As in to kind of still recreate uh, similar graphs from these ground proof eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So then, you know, essentially, as long as you generate, as long as your eigenvalue generator doesn't collapse, you can still generate new graphs, right? And well, the eigenvalue generator is kind of very simple, right? Because you just, like in this case, you just generate like two eigenvalues, right? Which is not, not a lot um, to ask for. Um, so yeah, so it, it actually is quite robust to, to collapse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and please do ignore this last line. I somehow wanted to put uh, new data in for for the final version of the paper, but uh, forgot to do that and then get around to doing that. So it's just a copy of the line above. Um, but yeah, so so essentially, you know, we have this MMD ratio, right? Where we can see that your regressive models, well, the grand does very well, but um, kind of well. This uh, statistic similarity is only one thing, right? It's like uh, another thing we care about is how diverse the graphs that we generate are, right? Because if we don't generate new graphs, then you know why are we even doing this? Um, so for this, we kind of have 
essentially three other measures, right? The validity is, is this kind of hard constraints on the graphs, as I mentioned before. In the case of planar graphs, is we just check how many of the graphs are planar, right? And as you can see, almost none, none of the models generate planar graphs in the end. Um, you know, the uniqueness is just measures how many of the uh, generated graphs are, you know, distinct or like what percentage of the generated graphs is distinct, right? And then the novelty checks how many of the generated graphs have not been seen in, uh, in the training set. So we can see that here, you know, like the grand model that's terribly overfit and essentially just recreates the training set. And I guess, well, as in, you know, there's only essentially like a, a few graphs to generate that are not from the training set. And uh, sadly, they're also not valid anymore, as in not planner in, in this case, as we check, you know, if it uh, matches all of the tree measures. As in, you know, it's a valid graph, and it's, it's planner, you know, it's uh, unique and, and not seen in the training set. Um, yes. For uh, for SBM, you know, it's um, we again have a validity measure. In this case, we uh, do a slightly different thing, and we uh, use a Markov chain Monte Carlo model to essentially fit SBM parameters to a given graph, or to guess SBM parameters for a given graph, right? And then we uh, just uh, do a statistics test to check if these parameters are kind of close enough, right, to to the true parameters that we use to generate the set. Uh, as in, you know, probabilities of inter and intra community edges. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, if, if, if a graph passes the, the test, you know, to consider it valid. Um, yes. Uh, another thing to look at here is that, um, you know, here we give like the time needed to generate a mini batch of 10 graphs, like, well, in parallel, right, for, for different models. And you can see that, like, the one shot models are, you know, orders of magnitude faster than the ultra regressive ones, right? Even their, like, though their complexity is, is the same, like technically also our complexity because of the use of poorly powerful graph neural network in it. And, um, and because um, we use the matrix exponentiation uh, to get the rotation matrices is technically cubic, which is technically terrible, right? It's uh, in, in practice because it's not ultra regressive, it's still like orders of magnitude faster than the ultra regressive ones. Um, yeah, and you know now we can actually look at some you know samples. Uh, so here, you know, well as you can see, also grand generates very good graphs because they're kind of mostly from the training set. Um, you know, and and the other models really don't visually don't do that well. Like as in, they are somewhat similar but not great, right? And we can see that this um, eigenvectors actually do help, right? And uh, we are able to generate graphs that look decent. Um, plus, you know, like a quarter of them is actually planar, which is, to be fair, like a very strict measure, right? Because they're setting one edge in the wrong place already kind of makes it not planar, even though they're well, Wait, they, they aren't planar, right? Are uh, no, oh, so this is a spring embedding, right? So, yeah, you don't see that they're exactly planar, but technically, yeah. at least one of these should be planar. <laughs> um, yeah, because like the problem is that you know, like plotting generated graphs as planner gives very terrible plots. Because you know, the normal planner plotting algorithms kind of try to um, do this weird thing as and put them on the grid, right? And then it's, yeah. it's a very not nice plot. And then as as in like only quarter of this, these are planner, you know, one weird plot. Oh, um, but visually they, they look pretty nice. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like the true graphs. Yeah, it looks it looks yeah decent and uh, and yeah, I kind of forgot to mention in the previous uh, part, right? That we have the two auto aggressive baselines of the graph R and the grand, which uh, grand is is kind of a bit nicer because it actually uh, uses a GNN inside of it. Well, graph R and N is just a like a stack of two R and Ns, right? One going over rows and one going over the cells in the row, which kind of you know is very far away from graph inductive bias, right? Um, so grand is much nicer because it uses GNN inside to determine which edges to add for the new node. So, so there's some graph inductive bias, right? But we have the mole GAN base, baseline. So for all the GAN baselines, we essentially, you know, we covered them before, right? Mole GAN uses an MLP, GGGAN uses like a random set of points, or GGGAN RS uses a random set of points as input to like uh, to, to, uh, to uh, equivariant neural network, right? And, and the normal GGGAN uses a fixed set of, of uh, 
uh, fixed set of points as support points that's so vented by noise. Um, and you know, for all again, we, uh, them to, we denote them by star because you know we added a bunch of these other improvements, right? Like processing the noise with a somewhat big MLP, that's normalization of noise to unit circle, you know, using a PPGN as discriminator and generator, right? Um, so to make sure that you know, like our thing works because of the spectrum part, not because of these all, all the other parts, we uh, we essentially use the same architecture for all of these models, right? We just don't condition them on spectrum. In case of GGAN, so the generator is also PPGN, right? And for MOGAN, we use a PPGN discriminator, but the generator is just replaced by MLP. But we still use the same OS preprocessing steps. Um, so they're kind of compared. Yes, and uh, and then if we kind of look at the um, the SBM graphs, right, that are kind of quite varied in the structures, and you can see in the data sets there's a good variety of, of like different cluster, uh, you know, uh, kind of different number of clusters, and the node counts differ and, and and whatnot, right? And and we can see that actually like the uh, ultra regressive models struggle quite a bit. Uh, well, another thing I forgot to mention. Is that each of this row is conditioned on the same number of nodes, right? So, so this would be like, I don't know, 200 ish nodes. And, you know, we always ask to generate a graph with 200 nodes, um, which by the, the, the way the data set is constructed at some points implies like a minimum number of clusters is needed because we capped it to at most 40 nodes per, per cluster. Um, um, yeah, so you can see that kind of this, the spectral conditioning, right, or the Sagan vector conditioning helps it. To follow this this um, kind of implicit structure we put into data set, right? It's kind of if you have many many nodes, you would expect some minimal number of connected components, right? Like for example, graph RNN uh, seems to completely fail, right? Like it, it always just kind of puts everything in two connected components and, and calls it a day, which like sometimes is fair enough, sometimes not so much. Um, and now you know for some real world data sets, we consider. Well, as, as people often do, uh, protein graphs, right? Like, so they're not attributed, just fewer structure of proteins, uh, or like amino acids that are connected if they're like fewer than, I think, six angstroms away, if I remember correctly. Um, and we can kind of again see that, you know, these MMD uh, ratios are quite nice, and, and, and the spectrum, which is a good MMD ratio, right? So the graphs are statistically similar. And uh, what I actually added in this table, but forgot to add in the previous ones. Is the results you get if you condition on true spectra from the test set, right? So the spectra is not seen as in the eigenvalues and eigen, first k eigenvalues and first k eigenvectors, but you take them from test set, right, and ask them to generate graphs. Um, and you know we can see that you know if we take the true uh, spectral conditioning, right, the MMD ratio still drops quite a bit. So essentially the PPGN is not the bottleneck or the adjacency generation, right? But probably the spectral generation could be improved. Um, and also, well, here the novelty we checked versus the test set is in generated graphs versus the test set because the eigenvectors and eigenvalues came from the test set. And all of them were technically not the same, at least. <laughs> uh, as in, it could be quite similar, actually, right? But, but you know, some edges and whatnot differ. So it doesn't necessarily, um, so those using those 16 eigenvectors doesn't necessarily strictly determine the graph we, we're going to get out of it. And uh, yeah, and what is, and well, again, you know, here we say that these one shot models are, you know, again, like way faster than, than the regressive ones. Of course, the scaling of especially our one with the PPGN test cubic, you know, that's, you know, in chump, but still much, much faster. Um, and one kind of interesting or silly worrying thing when we first saw this was that, you know, the Mogan, to use the MLP as a generator, uh, reaches absurdly good MMD ratio, right, compared to everything else. Uh, but turns out, because, you know, I guess somewhat unsurprisingly, you know, because it's an, just an MLP, it essentially always learns to generate one matrix, right? And because the proteins have varying number of nodes, you just cut a different part of the matrix, plus maybe change some random mesh somewhere, and that's technically a new graph, right? Because well, it's not, uh, not isomorphic anymore. Um, so to kind of quantify this a bit, we computed the mean at a distance. So, you know, we take uh, two graphs, well, consider like two graphs from the generated set, right? We uh, crop the bigger graph to the size of the smaller um, and just, you know, compute how many edges need to be changed for them to be the same, right, as a, as a percentage. Um, and uh, yeah, and take kind of the mean over, over all the comparisons, right? 
to do the comparisons, we do assume that the uh, ordering of nodes is fixed, which is not necessarily strictly true for some of the models, but for most of them it is, right? Because, well, the Mulgan with the MLP, we do expect it to kind of, you know, use one ordering of nodes potentially. Um, you know, the, the autoregressive models like explicitly enforce a fixed ordering. And then, you know, if we use GGGAN with a fixed number of, of uh, like a fixed initial set of points, right? Then it's again, well, a fixed set. So, you know, there's an ordering, like a force for GGGAN RS, and it's, it's, it's a random set. So that doesn't really hold. Uh, and for, for Spectre, it's also not strictly the case, right? Like if you used one uh, kind of uh, sample in the bank, right, of, of the Schiefel manifolds or the Eigenvector sets, you could presume it to somewhat be, right? But it isn't, right? And because kind of the eigenvector generator can technically do whatever, so it's, it's not really. Uh, so this is more like uh, you know, release. an upper bound. Yes. Oh, we are a bit out of time. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, I was thinking now that because we use teacher forcing with the like mm -hmm. vectors, I think that would also go like and like encourage it to but use the same order or no? But all the discriminators are in very like equivariant, right? So not really. Mm. I see. Yeah. So yeah. Um so yeah, so this is kind of you know like uh you know, more like an estimate of, of the edit distance, right? But it, it guarantees that the edit distance is at least this, right? Like if you kind of consider um, random permutations. And it says data sets as ordered, you know, as proteins are according to amino acid sequence. And you can see that, you know, we should expect the, 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 the lower bound essentially of the mean edit distance to be, you know, like high-ish, uh, while the mole GAN kind of, as, as we said, kind of completely collapses. And some of the autoregressive models, interestingly, well, you know, visually the graphs are still kind of distinct. This mean at the distance measure is not is, is a bit lower somehow. Um, yes, and uh, like well, all of these graphs were were non-attributed. Like technically, oh yeah, sorry, I first we'll have to show you some proteins. Um, so yeah, you know, kind of you can see that, but you know, they, they look somewhat similar. But the important thing to know is that actually, like none of these models, like well, you could. Do a really good job. You could kind of guess this from from the MMD measures because they're already you know like six at best, right, or sixteen or or, or maybe MMD ratios were kind of high. And in general, as a rule of thumb, we like from the experiments we did, we saw that you you do want the MMD ratio to be like around three or less to really see that the graphs are like visually very similar. Then you know, then kind of those strict measures that we had on like planar graphs and SBMs are like um, observed. Um, yeah, so for proteins, actually, like what we had to do, that we didn't have to do for any of the other graphs, you know, we actually needed to only display the, the, the largest connection components because all the models produce some random nodes that are just floating in the space. Um, and yeah, and the MMD measures are not that good, right? Even though visually some of these look not terrible. Uh, so these protein generation is certainly not a solved problem. Yeah, and I was saying before, you know, we kind of uh, did all the previous models were just structure only, of course, because when we do the PPGN, right, we can, uh, it essentially outputs an n by n by something matrix. So we can just output uh, instead of n by n by one for adjacency, we can output a larger matrix, right? And without the diagonal as like node features or without the off diagonal as, as edge features. Right? Uh, so we can generate technically edge features, right? And just everything is still just conditioned on the eigenvectors and eigenvectors, right? Each end doing the final thing. Um, yeah, so you know we can we try test it to generate with QMN molecules. You know it, it kind of works. Like of course, if you want to generate molecules for real, you probably want to use some actually model that meant for molecules, which is more more as a test and a comparison to to other small um, one shot models, right? It cannot work with these, you know, uh, like SBM or protein graphs that have hundreds of nodes in them. Uh, and and what we see is that you know the spectrum with with the spectral conditioning. Uh, actually uh, does uh, much better at you know generating value unique and normal graphs than the other model. Well, except the, the random set model, which is very random. Because the other models did, we did observe that they do collapse kind of very quickly. Potentially because the PPGN might be a bit of a too powerful model compared to the ones that are usually used for molecule generation. Um, but yeah, so this, you know, teacher forcing and spectral conditioning does help a bit to kind of avoid this small collapse. So, 
first of all, at right, and, and the molecules it generates, well, you know, they're, they're molecules, but uh, they're not super diverse, and, you know, you would expect much uh, more ring structures, you know, if you would look at the data set, which doesn't have much, and, you know, while they're technically valid, isn't, you know, the, the bond counts or the electron counts add up, they're not necessarily stable and stuff, because this uh, basic validity measures used do not really account for. Um, so, yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, finally, you know, again, to kind of reiterate the limitations of this, you know, is that the architecture is quite complex, right? And how this eigenvector generation should work, you know, it's like we propose an approach, right? But it's not clear if it's the best approach. And if, for example, we consider the MMD ratio is just on the generated eigenvalues, right? Like as if we take the first eigenvalues and, and directly treat them as a histogram and compute MMDs, we can see that they're actually quite large, you know, even larger than the graph MMDs were. So somehow the, the model progressively learns to somehow correct the mistakes while, you know, projecting to kind of uh, to, to the graph manifold. And uh, also, you know, if you consider the wavelet MMD, which kind of, you know, applies, applies a bank of filters on the first K eigenvectors, we can also see that, you know, if we use true eigenvalues, like it's already quite high, if we use fake eigenvalues, the MMDs grow again even bigger, right? There's a ratio between, again, the, the training and the test set. Um, so there's certainly work uh, to do, you know, on, on how to make the eigenvector generation uh, better. And, you know, another thing is that, you know, since we do dense matrices and also, uh, yeah, so we can mainly because we do dense matrices, you know, do, like we can generate large graphs, but not amazingly huge graphs with these small chart models. And uh, potentially, uh, you know, there's room to improve that, especially, you know, if you consider uh, some spectral condition, right? Because you could use uh, the, the spectrum to essentially pre partition the graph, right? Because if you see that, you know, the spectral embeddings are very far away from nodes, you potentially can, won't have an edge between them. So you can just not consider these edges, right? Your adjacency generation. So potentially you could improve uh, the scale of this. Um, yeah, and, uh, and with that, uh, we, we come to, to an end, right? And uh, the most important the message here is that the press can design where Andreas is working, is hiring. So if you're interested in doing some, some uh, machine learning on, on protein design, um, yeah, get, reach out to Andreas. Okay. Thank you very much for that nice presentation and going through the results as well. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I think Genentech also does exciting stuff, so I can support that message. Yeah. Cool, but then, um, so do you think this is, has actually some promise for molecule generation or some promise for protein generation? Um, so potentially, right? So like, well, for proteins, you could, I could imagine you use this, like you could use eigen, first few eigenvectors also as a template, right? To kind of generate somehow a simple, similar, but different protein, right? Um, in general, like, I think, you know, this idea of conditioning on some larger scale structure first, and then like doing the smaller scale later is, is a very good idea, right? Uh, but uh, maybe for proteins and, and things like that, there is a more uh, informed, you know, more kind of uh, an approach that's more based on, on actual, you know, biophysics knowledge. Because especially for molecules, people do do this a bit, right? Like you kind of generate um, larger substructures and then they see how to stitch them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... Yeah, well, my point of view is that uh, there's a, there's advantage to use models that are specific for molecules, for example, stitching them up such that you always have the pathway to know how to generate uh, a molecule. Uh, mm -hmm. But it also restricts a bit the, the creativity of what the model can do when the what the model can can generate. Uh, but it, anyways, in my opinion, the biggest challenge in molecular generation is not generating molecules i mean you can give uh, the you know like the kind of lego boxes of atoms and bonds to a kid and he can build tons of valid and unique molecules without any problem uh, so generating valid small molecules is not is not really the bottleneck it's really like how do you evaluate that what you generated makes sense um uh, and, uh, i would say the the, the value of 
generative models for molecules comes when we want to generate molecules conditioned on something like conditioned on some binding pocket please bind to that pocket or uh, generate molecules with some properties right yeah yeah exactly it's the, the conditioning that makes the model work but like uh if if the model that does the conditioning uh, can be overfitted the generative model will overfit it uh, like uh most likely overfit it unless you use some uh models that add restriction to the generation such as uh, taking specific building blocks and assembling them uh, so, so this kind of approach of taking building blocks and assembling them, it regularizes the model uh, to not producing any kind of insane, crazy thing, right? Um, so, so in some sense, like if you don't have a good discriminator, if you don't have a good model to do the conditioning, uh, the generative model is not is not the bottleneck. Hmm. Okay. But what do you think about like generating molecules uh, or if we are conditioned on something else in, in our 3D space, like some, some other molecule and we want to generate a second molecule that interacts with the first in, in some way, then right, a one-shot approach seems difficult to me or th there it seems better to have some auto regressive model that can sort of because in the beginning you don't you first have to come up with a number of atoms even right and how would you know what the right number of atoms is before you uh, assign the put them into their places and assign edges between them so, right. yeah. Yes, like in general, like one shot models do have a problem with number of nodes, right? Because you somehow, well, like I guess you always just then generate with, like you either condition a number of nodes or you just generate with n max and then somehow hope the model doesn't connect some of them, right? It's essentially the, the best you could hope for. Of course, for, for molecules in particular, you know, you can probably try all number of nodes, <laughs> like, because, you know, there's, like, you know, at least okay. if you consider small molecules, right, like, there's going to be, like, you know, 40 tries or something. Yeah, um, fair. Um, yeah, but it's like, so, but with the regressive approaches, it's also not necessarily trivial to decide when to stop, right, like, uh, because you could say that okay, when you know first time it doesn't get attached, you just terminate. But um, at least for these general graphs, sometimes they do also randomly add, like autoregressive models do randomly add some you node know, that is floating off in the space. So I don't know. yeah, no, I I agree there. Um, like if you do autoregressive, you have also lots of problem about uh, remembering what you did previously. Uh, when do you stop? Like uh, so, and uh, I think it also makes it uh, a lot easier to to overfit some local structures. Like if you find that some kind of structure is responsible for uh, for the activity, well, the autoregressive model it makes it easier to just reproduce that structure over and over and over again because it's good at reproducing at producing small structures, but it's not good at producing global global structure and this is why I, I really like this work about uh, one one shot graph generators um, using the spectrum and it's actually something like uh, I, I had thought about like uh, it's all these methods they generate the graphs without ever looking at the spectrum without ever looking at the global property of the graph uh, and uh, like one of the challenge when thinking about that is like yeah but like how do you go from eigenvalues to a graph that makes sense. Um, and uh, generating eigenvectors, like most people would just like laugh at the idea that it's it's going to be inf un unfeasible. It's going to be super hard to do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm actually really impressed by the kind of work that you've been able to, to put through, how you've been able to, to build an eigenvector generator, uh, which is, uh, I guess like 
uh, it, it probably was uh, hard to like, get every step right on the way. So like I congratulate you a lot on, on that part. Thank and you. I, I have to say that uh, Carolis did a great job. Really, I mean, it took us a while to, to hone into the right architecture and we had many, many ideas. But Carolis did an amazing job, right? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I also really like this uh, idea of just generating rotation matrices and applying them to some some original uh, matrix. And yeah, do you have any other ideas where some eigenvector generation might be useful? That's a good question. I mean, maybe if we have a lot of people here. Maybe some somebody has, knows of a problem. Uh, I'm not so sure if we still have that many people here. Okay. <laughs> talking uh, talking about this uh, eigenvector generation, like um, how does your model deal with the co-spectral graphs that have same eigenvalues but different mm -hmm. eigenvectors? Do, do you have an idea? Uh, yeah, so it, it, it kind of doesn't, right? Or like we didn't explicitly do anything, right? For, for it. To do this, we of course feed in noise, right, to the eigenvector generator, right. So it kind of has a chance of like kind of trying to generate something different for, for the same eigenvalues. Uh, but we didn't do anything explicit for that. Um, and another thing is that I guess you know in practice there's not that many graphs that are co-spectral, right? Like yes, there are, right, but they're very kind of particular graphs. Yeah. Yeah. It's most of a, mostly a problem if you're in a discrete domain, like so if you have um, uh, like a zero one entries on the ADCC matrix. Um, if you know they're regular graphs and you're gonna have a lot of multiplicities and so on. But uh, I mean, if you just add a little bit of noise, it will break all these symmetries up with a very, very, very high probability. So it doesn't seem to be such a big problem. Um, yeah. Sure. But I mean, there are, there are so many data modalities, right, where you can compute some sort of eigenvectors or spectrum from them. And yeah, I suppose <laughs> that for generating these data modalities, this would work just as well, or is something you could try as well. Perhaps I, I, we couldn't come up, maybe, I don't know, point clouds or something, but we couldn't find yeah. of. Uh, uh, a good example, or, yeah, or at least a better example. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, a better example than this. Um, another interesting question that we had that we were not able to answer was, okay, suppose that we give you a UK matrix. How do we know there is that a valid, uh, you know, it could be, you know, um, ortho that the vectors are ortho orthogonal to each other. Do we know whether it still is a valid matrix for that builds a graph or not? Um, it seems like a very hard problem to check. So I don't know if you know any fundamental math result that uh, gives you the solution. We would be very interested. No, I don't. Yeah. So what do you mean by taking an Euclidean matrix and seeing if it's good to build a graph? If if we, we focus no, I mean if you focus on all the eigenvector matrices that come from an actual graph, where you know a simple graph mm -hmm. with no weights, that's you know they're much fewer than the Stiefel manifold. So how do we know that a uh, eigenvector matrix we created is actually uh, corresponding to a simple graph or not? We don't. Mm, yeah. No, if we know part uh, only few eigenvectors, you know we don't. Yeah, yeah, this is kind of related to that projection uh, that you mentioned, right? But I, I have seen some work uh, related to like uh, the distribution of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, like depends on uh, not mostly the distribution of eigenvalues uh, that when you are in a real world graph or like when you, you are in a type of graph that looks in the same family, uh, the distribution of eigenvalues will will be quite similar. I, I don't don't remember what's uh, what's the name of like uh, that that kind of statement or like 
uh, where to look at it, but perhaps I could share. Uh, I think for, for eigenvalues, we know a lot of stuff. Yeah. They, you know, they follow, for instance, the semicircle law for the random graphs. And there are a lot of limits that are known, but for eigenvectors, it's very tough. I don't know of any results. Uh, yes, Dominic, the name of the work is Network Density of the States. Uh, that they are looking into the, let's say, these spectrum of the, the distribution of the uh, eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ali, for seeing no me here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Also, um, if possible, like uh, to to discuss a bit more about the, the limitation of the current work, like uh, what kind of graph or like what kind of property do you see that like uh, the, the specter method fails? Mm -hmm. um, I, I see that like it, it seems to work really well on planner graphs, but then like when we go on community graph or protein graph where the number of edges uh, becomes more variable, uh mm -hmm. like the the quality of the graph decreases like am i right to think that um with the specter approach you're able to get a very good global arrangement but uh on the local arrangement it, it's a bit harder right well so, so honestly to an extent it's even the the opposite of that right because like uh actually i think the sbm was the the, the graph that uh, performed the best right like as in you know the ratio like md ratio for example is almost one and if we do this kind of p test of how close the uh the actual probabilities right of of, of the uh, generated sbm graph look like they're in many cases like very similar uh, but if if you go to the images for instance mm -hmm. um yeah so it seems that well, maybe, maybe it's uh, it might be also just in my mind, but it seems that like the number of edges between the communities mm -hmm. uh, here versus here, for example, uh, you have a, a lot more edges in between yes. communities than uh, what the original graph has. Uh, yeah, so like in the very last graph, that's definitely true, yeah. right? And the row above, I would say that, I don't know, it's similar, right? But then the very topmost is even maybe sparser. But uh, but yeah, so it, I'm not sure. I don't think it's sparser. Mm -hmm. Like if you look even that part here, like it's so dense that there are true, actually true. Dense, nodes dense. in between communities. Well, um, so it, yes, but this is yeah. partially just a spring of many. But yeah, it's true. So on communities, I'm not sure if it's like that bad, but in general, it does seem to produce graphs that are a bit or a bit or dense. And especially in proteins, you can see that, well, of course, the graph RNA also produces something that's way over dense, right? And the RAN produces something that's yeah. kind of too sparse, and the specter again produces something that's a bit too dense. I mean, what would even be a good protein graph, right? Like if you generate something without coordinates. Yeah, yeah, like as a general structure, it's, it's kind of a hard problem to generate. Well, kind of. I think I could way. show you. I could show you many graphs, um, and you couldn't tell whether or not they come from, or like take one protein and show you many different arrangements of that protein graph, and you couldn't tell if they where from that protein or another one or no protein at all. See you, Andreas. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Nice to see Thank you. Thank you so much. For the, it's very kind and uh, a very nice discussion. Hmm. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Um, yeah, so, so, so the, yes, but that's also true for any bigger graph, right? Like, as in even two SBMs, like, you know, if you consider two SBMs that are kind of, you know, all like, as in, you know, you plot these two SBMs, it will probably be, you know, plot 10 copies of these two things, right? And that's tell me which is A, which is B, right? You will hardly have better, you know, guessing at like than, you know, 50%, right? Like if... No, I, I, like I think like we can pretty safely say this is 
like this graph is coming from an SPM, right? Like where? Oh, so that sure, sure. But like proteins also have some structure, right? Like as in you, you can see that it's some entangled path, which sure is not. It's like a very you know ge ge generic thing to say, but it, it it does usually look like some strain that somebody you know did uh, uh, some knot with, right? Yeah. Whether in the generated graphs, like you clearly see that this kind of bubble here. Well, you, you have a smaller bubble here in the other graph, but like, uh, yeah, you don't you don't have that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it it looks it looks more like a nice ropes, uh, not a yeah, nice yeah, ropes yeah. tied together. Yeah. 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 So so yes, but that's also because it's a non-attributed protein, right? It's like if, yeah. If it had attributes, then you could actually say something about it. Look at that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yes. so one thing, uh, one, one thing I was thinking about, like uh, maybe helping in this uh, thing that, like maybe the graphs are might be too dense or like the, the node degree might not be uh, might not be right. Um, because I've done a lot of work using eigenvectors for positional encoding, not for generation but mm -hmm. for property prediction, and uh, they they help a lot on the global level. Uh, but then on the local level, they're not that good. Um, mm -hmm because like it's um uh, especially the the larger the graph like the closer the eigenvector of two close nodes become mm -hmm. and uh one paper that i found very interesting by uh vj duvedi about um using uh random walk the diagonal of the random walk as a structural encoding uh mm -hmm. so you just take like the adjacency matrix a you multiply yeah. it by z minus one and you power it to the k and you take many mm -hmm. different values of k it can give you like an idea of the neighbor of the neighbor of that given node okay. and from that for, like from that if you also generate conditionally generate something like that and uh, then you can always retrieve also the adjacency matrix um like uh, th there are techniques mm -hmm. because the the eigenvectors the eigenvectors of d minus a uh, d minus one a are the same as the eigenvectors of d minus one a. Uh, yeah. Sorry, like the, the eigenvectors, if you have the power k or you don't have the power k, remain the same. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can always retrieve a from that one, that part. Uh, but using this kind of uh, encoding on the node level, like it helps a lot, like the node understanding its local structure and might help like getting these threads into the protein mm -hmm. uh, into the protein graph or even getting um, um, or like in the community graph like having less nodes at the intersection and having like more um, like be because right now it seems to really work well on the global structure but a bit less on the the locality uh, so this is why like uh, maybe also conditioning mm -hmm. on this kind of generation um will will help a lot yes potentially so like um yeah like in general this you know global versus local structure is is yeah it's it's also a bit of a hyperparameter, right of how of what k we use right yeah. because like kind of the the more the higher the k the smoother essentially the the, the structure presentation but also the problem is that the higher the k the harder it is to generate eigenvectors <laughs> so it's uh yeah so like it's also possible that there is some better approach that is also still this, you know, like kind of traditional global structure that you somehow generate and then you kind of fill in the local structure. That's not necessarily directly based on eigenvectors, but something else, right? That's also yeah. maybe, you know, easier to generate than eigenvectors. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know what that is, at least at, at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, but generating the first k eigenvector, I think like uh, it's a very good, uh, like it's a great achievement from your work, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's going to be very relevant uh, in terms of giving the right global structure. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. So with that, it, it does help. Yes, a lot. Of course. Yeah. It's still like uh, you also asked on which graphs it uh, works on it and which it doesn't. So, for example, one thing that didn't work very well is grid graphs, somewhat counterintuitively, right? Because like their spectrum is super defined, like as in it's just a two boson functions, right? Uh, it had also kind of then end up defining the actual positions of the grid. But like 
well, what is what does a data set of grid graphs look like? Like, is it just um, oh, so it's like you know, you could just do like a 10 by 10 grid, 10 by 11 grid, 10 by 12 grid, you okay. know, up to up yeah. to like 20 times 20 grid or something, like yeah. Um, yeah, so well, of course, with the grids, another problem is that the number of nodes varies wildly, right? Because just going from uh, 15 times 15 grid to 15 times 16 grid, that's a big jump in, in the graph size. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, medium jump, but uh, still. But so, so you know, what was interesting is that, you know, if you give true spectra, like just two eigenvectors or whatever, right? It's fine. You can generate a, the, well, the same grid, because there's, you know, only one grid for a given spectra. Uh, but generating the, the, the fake eigenvectors for, for a grid, for example, turn out to be very problematic because they are super, you know, uh, um, kind of determined, right? Or like very periodic because it's really just a cosine function. Uh, so yeah, so, so somehow the, the, the eigenvector generation in some cases lacks fidelity, right? Like as in, if you really want to generate like literally a, a cosine function, it's a bit, um, you know, So yeah, so so um, as as far as limitations go, like so modeling some uh, very strict spectra is yeah okay more work. <laughs> so I'll yeah, I'm just convinced that this um, eigenvector generation is a cool thing. <laughs> I'm convinced that you can use that for a lot of other data modalities as well. So, okay, yeah, you, can, you can show us how, which. Yeah, so, so many other data modalities, right, where you can compute some spectrum, like. Uh, yeah, you know. yes, but it's always, you know, a question, I guess, if, 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 if it's better than what you can do without spectrum, right? Because, like, even for images, like, technically, you know, like, uh, yeah. like yeah. JPEG encoding is a bit, you know, like spectral decomposition, right? But you can just generate images quite well as it is, right? So. I mean, yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> Let's maybe call it the day here. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, unless other points come up. And otherwise, thanks, Johannes, for the, the nice questions. I would also thank the other people if they were still here. But, yeah, thank, thank you all for all the questions. It was very nice. Okay. At the begin in the beginning, I thought this eigenvector generation problem was something that others tackled before and then they implemented into this graph generation idea but apparently this eigenvector generation is a whole new thing so maybe go ahead and use it in your own uh, data generation tasks and uh, I'm pretty sure that a lot of impressive research can come out of that idea and if you want to join the future reading group sessions yourself all the information is in the description.